we were at the point where we weren't able to, we probably wouldn't have been able to pay civil servant salaries. Yeah. I mean, they were that yeah, they were on the very ropes. Bad shape. In this negotiation, there was, there was never a sense ever that the U.S. was going to walk away, mm -hmm. ever. Putin came in and you've seen this really uh, intensified alliance between mm -hmm. Russia and Iran. Hi, I'm Paul Salem with the Middle East Institute's Vantage Point. I'm uh, thrilled and very happy to have with me today Jay Solomon. Uh, Jay is the Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. He covers international diplomacy, nuclear weapons, proliferation, counterterrorism, and the Middle East and Asian affairs from their Washington, D.C. office. Uh, uh, he's been nominated three times for a Pulitzer Prize. and. Uh, uh, we've asked Jay in today to talk about his new book, which I will wave about here, The Iran Wars, an excellent read, which I'm just finishing up as an audiobook, which you can get as well. Uh, it recounts uh, the uh, long story of Iran's, or the U.S. sort of contention with Iran from the 1979 revolution onwards, but focuses very much on the developments that led to and ended up in the uh, JCPOA, the nuclear accord with Iran in uh, 2015. Jay, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, and let's start uh, with you maybe, re maybe emphasizing what were the main takeaways from your research uh, uh, as relates to where we ended up at the end of the Obama administration. Sure. What went, went well, what went poorly? I mean, the book actually kind of had its roots in the kind of the end of the Bush administration into Obama where I had the felt feeling that something was, was going to give, because you had proxy wars in, in Iraq, in, in Lebanon, in the Palestinian territories. You had this nuclear program advancing very quickly, and you had what I argue is kind of an unprecedented financial war that the United States unleashed on Iran, really sort of towards 2006 and really accelerating mm -hmm. into Obama's second term. And I think my, my biggest takeaway was that in a lot of ways, this was an incredibly well-executed strategy towards Iran. It, it brought their... And you go through the sort of the technicalities of it with the U.S. Treasury in a way that I haven't seen anywhere else. It yeah. It's very enlightening. No, it was a really very focused kind mm -hmm. of escalatory attack, starting with banks, insurance companies, and eventually in 2012, cutting half of Iran's oil exports mm -hmm. out. So mm -hmm. I argue it was an incredibly executed strategy. But then when the negotiations really picked up in secret first in, in 2012 and then became public in 2013 to 2014, I was a bit surprised how Iran, which had an extremely weak hand at that point, mm -hmm. particularly with oil prices collapsing and being very much isolated, they got in a lot of ways what they had wanted from the beginning, which was the right to have an industrial scale nuclear mm -hmm. program at some well, let point. Let me ask you sort of a, a two level question. Sure. There's one level which is that it was a strategy to put the screws on Iran and through the Treasury, a lot of that was financial and economic, to get them to the negotiating table. There's that strategy, which is at one level, do you think that was sort of the right approach? Because others would say negotiation is never going to get you anywhere. You should, and some have even talked about regime change. Right. Rather. So that's sort of one level of strategy, which maybe you agree with as a general approach. The second level, which is what you sort of focus on in the book, is that it was the right strategy to get them to the negotiating table, but what was agreed on at the table was weak or was you know, skewed in one direction. How would you ad address those two levels? Well, I think on the, on the first level, I think there was, there's always been disagreement mm -hmm. about what was the strategy. I know Secretary John Kerry and the Obama White House at the end said, well, no, these sanctions were always about just getting them to the table. It was never about regime change. Mm -hmm. I would argue that there were a lot of people in the Treasury Department and other parts of the government who are like, no, the, the Iranians support all of these militant groups. They're involved in proliferation of weapons. They're, um, they have a ballistic missile program. This was about keeping Iran in a box. Yeah, and in general. In general. Yeah. And it always was very difficult to sort of hive off the nuclear issue mm -hmm. from all of these other issues. And just to say, if we resolve at least temporarily, the nuclear issue will lift, will get them out of the box. Right. Is what you're... And, and I say that's that's was always kind of a dicey proposition yeah. because 
the as the book really recounts the the time it took and diplomatic effort to get that type of financial pressure on Iran was incredibly hard mm -hmm. and to bring that back I think short of Iran testing a nuclear bomb or something would be very mm -hmm. very difficult so you've got this agreement where there are constraints on the program for about a decade I think most people think it's in Iran's interest to stick with it because mm -hmm. they basically they're allowed to keep continue developing missiles, doing what they're doing in Syria. And yeah. yeah. And in 10 years, this restrictions, a lot of ways, come out, mm -hmm. come off. Um, so it's in their interest in a lot but of ways. You talk a lot about, the obviously, the sanctions and the U.S. side of the mm -hmm. sanctions. But this was a P5 plus one. There were U.N. Security Council sanctions, uh, which all together supposedly brought Iran to the table. Right. How much do you think was it U.N. Security Council and others, other, in other words, other countries working with the U.S. and others to squeeze Iran to get it to the table? Or was it sort of 80% U.S. Treasury and New York banks and only 20%? And this is relevant because I, I can understand that when the U.S. approached other countries, the other countries agreed to impose sanctions in order to talk about the nuclear program. That was an agreement among right. the different countries. It's also relevant that moving forward, the U.S. can still have its own sanctions, but it'll be difficult to get the other countries on board. But were they very important? I mean, I, I'm a little skeptical because I remember starting in like 2006 up until 10, 11, billions of dollars of fines were put on French and other European banks. And, you know, those really scared the daylights out of these companies. Mm -hmm. They didn't, even today with an agreement, you still don't see many European banks going off. back in because yeah. they don't know what's going to happen. So I do believe the Obama administration strategy in some ways was effective in the sense that under Bush, everyone blamed the U.S. for, you know, this, this standoff. We were too intransigent. Obama's kind of flipping of it and say, look, we're ready to talk. We're ready to negotiate, sending letters to the supreme leader. Mm -hmm. I think that was an effective tool in getting these other countries to play ball. But I still think a huge part of the effectiveness of those sanctions was the this proposition that they basically put out, which is, look, you can do business with Iran, or you mm. could do business in the U.S. dollars, but you can't do both, and you've mm. got to choose. And they basically knew that if you're know that you're any kind of scaled company on on any level, you need access to dollars, mm. and that's why I was surprised as the negotiations were going on. The U.S. almost started to talk down the sanctions, saying, "Look, they're not going to hold." Um, you right. Know, they were and, saying, "Yeah, if we don't do this, you know, it'll fall apart," and so on. Yeah. And, and I think which it hasn't, in a sense. Uh, yeah, despite yeah. John Kerry running around Europe last year, like asking people to go back, mm -hmm. they still weren't. So, I think they wanted a deal. They kind of conditioned it by saying, "Look, we need it now." But I think they could have kept this financial pressure well, on, and, you, and I yeah. think they could have gotten a better deal. As an aside, I mean, the Treasury Department and the, the sanctions as a weapon, mm -hmm. as it were came out in spades with this confrontation with Iran in mm -hmm. a way that you know, equivalent to what Department of Defense can do or the intelligence community. As an aside, is this the first time that the U.S. has realized the power of the Treasury and the banks in a huge international confrontation like this? Has it been used elsewhere? Is this sort of the first time that Treasury finds itself as effective as DOD? Yeah, I mean, I think yes. I think if you looked at like yeah. the, the Iraq situation it was essentially trade sanctions through the UN which mm. basically said you know there's a UN embargo on Iraq you can't do business there unless you get some sort of waivers mm. and I think we found that most companies didn't have a lot of fear of the UN they thought it was a very leaky proposition and there was a lot of cheating in the Iraq situation the brilliance of the the Iran strategy I think was like you basically accept that people are probably going to cheat mm -hmm. but you're making it their own business decision look we need it's to have dollars. Risk. It's yeah. their risk. Um, you know, the, I, th I think the, the first kind of aha moment after 9-11 was North Korea. Mm -hmm. There was one bank in Macau that the North Koreans were using for all sorts of illicit and money laundering purposes. And the U.S. Treasury didn't even sanction it outright. It just said this, con co this bank is a money laundering concern. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. saw a run on the bank and essentially North Korea's all of their nodes in the financial system internationally froze. I think that was kind of the aha moment and mm -hmm. it was replicated mm -hmm. in Iran. I think the real question is, could you, can the Trump administration in the North Korea situation now kind of accelerate these sanctions, which would put the U.S. on a real conflict uh, course with China, because mm -hmm. 90 percent of North Korean trade goes through North Korea, uh, through China. So I think that's one mm -hmm. example. Ch and Russia, I mean, 
they have yeah, sanctions since, on Russia are used now, and they're painful on the Russians. Yeah. But not to the extent that they were used on Iran. So going back to the deal itself, mm -hmm. I mean, some said if you know there wasn't sort of a negotiated deal, even under very intense sanctions, Iran was increasing subterfuges and centrifuges and subterfuges probably, uh, and moving towards a bomb. Uh, and, and that the options were negotiate, find a deal, put it off at least for 10 years, make the breakup period about one year, not three months, and that those were the real options. Do you agree with that? I mean, I've, I felt that by late 2012, in some ways, there was kind of a, the Israelis had set this kind of line of, they can't start enriching uranium to 20% purity. Mm -hmm. If they do, we're going to take action. And the Iranians never really passed it. So in some ways, it felt like there was, there was kind of a bit of a red line set, mm -hmm. and they didn't move beyond it. I guess I am somewhat sympathetic to the idea that this wasn't sustainable in the long term, that at some point, the Iranians were going to keep expanding. I, I guess where I, I still think people don't remember is when Rouhani took power in 2013, mm -hmm. they were, he's even said publicly in recent months, we were at the point or we weren't able to, we probably wouldn't have been able to pay civil servant salaries. Yes. I mean, they were that yeah, they were on the very ropes. they were in bad shape, yeah. And, and I just... But the they seem to be sort of willing to starve their people to keep, you know, the, the nuclear, I mean, nuclear program for the, maybe the IRGC and others is, was such Sank a percent. sort of a important project. It's hard to say what yeah. they would have done, perhaps. I guess, I guess yeah. I still get down to the tactics because in this negotiation, there was, there was never a sense ever that, the U.S. was going to walk away, mm. ever. It was kind of, this process just kind of took on a, mm. a, a, a life of its a own. Life of its own and yeah. you just kind of knew there was going to be agreement. And Obama's people, you know, they said military options were basically off the table. They said the sanctions weren't holding. And they, they kind of set these deadlines mm -hmm. of the, on their own political agenda. And the Iranians were extremely adept at kind of reading our political system and our tactics. Um, I mean, it was interesting when you watch these week on end talks because you had almost the entire Iranian negotiating team had, you know, gone to University of Denver, mm. or Kansas. Yeah, they know America and America doesn't know them. Yeah, the exactly. And, yeah. They, and, they would, and they were gaming us out. So, I mean, I, I still think the strategy was right. I, I just, so in a sense, you might be saying the strategy was right, a deal would have been a good thing, but we, we weren't tough negotiators. We could have gotten a very... A much better deal. I think we could have gotten a big better. deal, and I think there was yeah. a real potential under yeah. Trump, or even if Hillary Clinton had been elected, that this thing doesn't hold because it's so intertwined with everything else. You know, Trump, well, let me get to yeah. there. Obama's uh -huh. gone. Yep. President Trump is here with his team. Not clear exactly who's doing what. A lot of positions still unfilled. But two questions. One is, regardless of the Trump team and who might want to do what, and we'll get to that. What has the, any new administration inherited with Iran and with this deal? What's holding? What's not holding? What are deadlines that are relevant? What's the sanctions situation? Sure. I mean, the deal has held, mm -hmm. but in kind of a, if you really looked at the terms, there were two times over the past year where Iran kind of got to this brink of violating what's called heavy water production, which mm -hmm. is part of a nuclear program, heavy water. And they, the first time they breached the, this, their, the cap See, on what they're yeah. supposed to produce, the U.S. actually went and bought it from them to keep them in compliance, mm -hmm. which some people say is borderline you know, coercion. Yeah, complicity. <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. And then a second time they kind of blo broke it, and it, I think the Russians stepped in. So mm -hmm. they've kind of been testing the terms of the deal, even though they've been in compliance just on the nuclear front. Mm -hmm. And, and it's held, but it, it has taken kind of more money in some, ex, in some instances to keep them on board. On the other hand, they've launched at least a dozen ballistic missile mm -hmm. tests since the deal was, was enshrined, and it still gets back to the point. You know, so in terms of the, the deal itself and this administration and timelines, four years, yeah. you know, let's not think of what happens after that, but the deal is a 10-year deal. Uh, all things being equal and within certain parameters, this should should hold, right? I mean, yes, testing the margins and little, you know, bugs here and there. But as you're sort of reading is that since they haven't torn it up, as they've said, yeah. that framework is going to hold regardless of what else happens. Is that I mean, I think there's reading? a good chance. I mean, the Trump administration on the surface or publicly says they're still reviewing 
their policy towards yes. Iran. They announced new sanctions on uh, some Revolutionary Guard mm -hmm. companies, the they now ex national. They the whole thing. Uh, I mean, that, that yeah. to me, I mean, I think there are the potential that if, you mm. know, if they sanction the Revolutionary Guard as an entity, businessmen I've talked to said, you know, if you want to do business as a foreign company in Iran, the number of companies that aren't linked to the Revolutionary yeah. Guard is a <laughs> very minimal. small number. Yeah. So if they sanction the IRGC as a whole, I think there's, there is a risk, a potential mm. that the Iranians could say you're in compliance. You said there'd be no, you're not, you're no longer in compliance. You said there would be no, we think you, you said there'd be no more sanctions. Mm. So that could kind of blow it up. Um, it's a potential. And I think there's also, if you listen to some of the stuff people around Obama, uh, Trump have been saying, it's kind of like they're on notice is what General Flynn said right before, he before he left. <laughs> but I still think there is a sense and a, and a, basically a uh, commitment now to really push back against Iranian opportunities. Well, let me ask you about that. I yeah. mean, obviously, this administration in all of its wings uh, uh, takes a very dim view of Iran and finds Iran to be very, very adversarial, quite different than the Obama administration. Yeah. And that includes, obviously, the president and his, all of his national security team, as well as his domestic ideology team. Uh, now, when you look at sort of how this administration might want to contain, push back, punish. There is the nuclear deal itself, which seems that it's not going to be abandoned completely. Right. There's the whole question of new sanctions. They've started with some. I'm sure there'll be others, whether it's the whole IRGC or others. So there's, there's sanctions leverage that can be used. There is responding to missile tests militarily, which was hinted at. You know, you could bring in anti-missile ships and so on. And then there's Iran's presence in the Levant and in Yemen. So it's a very complicated chessboard. Yeah. And it's interconnected because if you push back on Iran in one place, they might hurt you in Iraq or they might hurt you. So do you see sort of a, a strategy, a coherent strategy that's equivalent to the complexity of the problem you're dealing with? Yeah. Other than we hate Iran, you know, there's a problem, we can't trust them and we want to contain them. How, yeah, how does I, it play out? Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to... Yeah, and, keep, and try to increase financial sanctions on Iranian entities that mm. allegedly aren't part of the nuclear program. Yeah. That's, that's very difficult because it's all interlinked. Mm -hmm. But I, I think I've heard they're already starting to sort of like coordinate with the Saudis and the Emiratis to increase, you know, support for what the Saudis and the Emiratis are doing in Yemen, for example. Yeah, Yemen, clearly, there's yeah. a shift and it's doable there because Iran is not very influential, so right. it can be, in a sense, pushed there. Yeah. But I do think there's potential for some standoff in the Gulf because you've mm. seen Iranian back the Houthi militia. I know it's debatable how much they're taking their orders from the Iranians, but you've seen Strong U.S. Yeah, yeah, U.S. ships fired at a Saudi naval mm -hmm. vessel recently, basically destroyed Emiratis ships attacked. I think that is a potential flashpoint mm -hmm. if the U.S. Mm -hmm. I think within the first couple of weeks, General Mattis, there was discussion about should we interdict uh, an Iranian ship going into Yemen. So how does it play out? I think there is a lot, there's a potential for a much more um, a standoff in, in the mm. Gulf between U.S. and Iranian naval vessels. Um, more I think on Yemen. More on Yemen, yeah. more efforts probably to cut off uh, shipments that Iran is moving into Syria. And you hear this overall strategy of from Trump people, we can somehow drive a wedge between Iran and Russia. And yeah, that you wrote a piece about yeah. that, I think, this week or uh -huh. last week. Tell me a bit about that. I mean, is it credible? I was meeting with Russians last week in Berlin, and all you get from them is a very deep commitment to their general relationship with Iran. Of course, they have differences, yeah. but you didn't get a sense that, you know, they're willing to go in any deeply different direction. Do you sense any other expectations from the U.S. side? I think it's, prob it's probably a bit of wishful thinking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not exactly new. If you, you know, Obama's people really reached out to Medvedev when he was president, and basically he, they did get Russian su support on sanctions against Iran, but then Putin came in, and you've seen this really uh, intensified alliance between mm -hmm. Russia and Iran. I think one of the more cynical parts of, of this book of what happened was when the U.S. was negotiating with the P5 was one in Europe, there was this hope that, God, if we can get this agreement, the Russians and the Iranians are going to work with us more closely mm -hmm. to end 
the, situ- the, the war in, in Syria. And what we found out was actually they were having their own mm-hmm. negotiations on the side to really escalate their mm-hmm. own joint military operations. Yeah, when they got and, that in the bag, they ramped it up. Yeah, they, I mean, within weeks they, yeah. were, they launched it. So I'm pretty skeptical that the sense is the Russians would demand sanctions lifting, mm-hmm. basically a blind eye in Crimea, um, other... Their sort of zone of influence. Yeah, they're, they're respecting it. And, yeah. yeah. And I, I mean, you're an expert on this region. The, the Iranians on the ground inside Syria, through Hezbollah, through all these militias that they've trained and deployed, in a lot of ways have a lot more influence on the ground, on the ground than the Russians do. do. Yeah. So could the Russians really kind of pull the plug on these guys, even if they wanted it, I think is real a real question. And at its heart, I think Putin and the Supreme Leader have a desire to push back American influence in Syria, in Iraq. Yeah, I mean, I so, always think, you know, what Iran and Russia have in common as sort of a fundamental partnership, maybe it's not an alliance, is what they both agree on is they don't want America to be great again. Yep. If you want to, I mean, they, they agree on that, contain, Iran, contain the U.S., weaken it, and so on. Russia loves doing that, and Europe and the Middle East, obviously Iran loves doing that. And there's no other state in the Middle East that Russia can work with on that overall goal, which is weakening the U.S., yeah. which is why I think they'll probably stick together. But perhaps on Syria, because of, the, because of its proximity to Israel, and Israel's concern about Hezbollah expanding its influence and more Shiite militias closer to the Golan and so on, and Israeli-Russian relations are very good, and of course U.S.-Israeli relations are good. Maybe there's something there that the Russians could help with at least to move some of the Hezbollah and, and Shiite militias at least further away from areas of concern. But other than that, I don't see... I mean, it was pretty striking. Yeah. I talked to some Israeli officials after Netanyahu met Trump last week, and yeah, there is kind of some sort of, I don't know if it's a blind faith or the Russians, but they, they basically, the Israelis see Hezbollah and the Revolutionary Guard much more deployed on their borders on the Syrian side mm-hmm. than ever before, and kind of this hope that like you said, relations with Russia are pretty good. They could, they're telling them, you know, you're playing with, you're going to get stung if you keep yeah. cooperating with these guys. That somehow the Russians will push back the Iranians inside Syria. But I think that's a pretty difficult yeah, proposition. Yeah, it's a very new reality. I mean, Israel always had sort of the Lebanon war option, that if Hezbollah becomes too threatening, they do a costly war in Lebanon. Yep. But a war now would have to be a war in Lebanon and Syria. Yep. And that's really not feasible. So... It is a concern yeah. because it creates great instability in what has been a stable Lebanese-Israeli border at least since 2006. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, what's your next book, Jay, since we enjoyed this one? <laughs> Are I'm, you I'm, taking a break? I'm taking a little bit of a break because there's so much going on yeah. with the Trump administration. I'm One idea I'm flirting with is North Korea just because it's a... Mm-hmm. It it's feel- a simi- not similar, but I mean, it's you, you know, there's stuff you can maybe carry a bit. And it here. feels like a similar dynamic in the sense in... Obama, 2009, 2010, you kind of have this feeling like, okay, the status quo with Iran isn't gonna sustainable. Hold, yeah. Well, are we headed to a conflict? Are they going to get a, a weapon? Are the Israelis going to, you know, uh, bomb them? It, it felt not mm-hmm. sustainable on its path, and that's why I was interested in exploring it a lot yeah. more. With North Korea, they actually are way more advanced Absolutely. than the Iranians, and, you know, between Kim Jong un assassinating his brother in law in Malaysia to them shooting off ballistic missiles, and, mm-hmm. and even the Chinese are saying they've probably got 40 or so atomic weapons. That situation doesn't feel mm. sustainable either. So I think it's a, it's a, and it's another situation where I think the U.S. is going to use financial coercion, probably cyber attacks. We're talking about deploying missile mm-hmm. shields in mm-hmm. South Korea. It's, it's got a lot of kind of missing um, moving parts. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that. Uh, again, uh, a plug for Jay's book, uh, The Iran Wars, an excellent uh, excellent account, excellent analysis. And Jay, thank you so much for thank coming today. Thank you so much. Today. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you for being with us. See you at the next Vantage Point.